Alrighty. So, let's get started. Um, I want to do um, a little wrap up of um, cache and virtual memory that I normally try to do before the exam that we, we did on, on Monday, but just for another time. Uh, and then I'm going to start a new section on uh, parallel architectures. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so let's, uh, let's consider, uh, again, we've got our CPU. And we have our memory subsystem. So we, we have some address, specifically it's a virtual address, and it's going to come in to our memory subsystem. And we know that this consists of uh, at least one level of cache connected to our memory right here. So what I'd like to explore um, uh, is where we should put the TLB. Okay? So the options are that we can put the TLB right here so that uh, we do a translation from virtual to physical address before we touch any of the memory system. Or we can move that to some place in here. Okay? So, um, any suggestions on where you would like to have the TLB? Either at the front of this memory system or in the middle of the memory subsystem. One up front, sure. Why? Um, because it would be faster to access energy. Uh, why would it be faster to access? Um, what, what would be faster to access, maybe, is a better question. Um, Um, I'm not sure I'm following. Would be the like the So, in general, that you would think that this would be slower, right? Because I have just introduced a longer path between uh, here and here, right? Uh, longer path, like as in like physical wiring, or not just that, but actually like you have to go through here and you have to do some translation process, right? right? Be because um, because you have to spend some time, even uh, if the TLB is small, you have to spend some time in the translation process of saying, hey, this is the virtual address I want, but the physical address I'm going to use is this other physical address right here. Right? So this is conceivably going to be slower. It should never be faster, right? All right? So if, if we go along those lines, uh, then we do something like this, okay? Which should make our cache look up faster, okay? This is an engineering decision, so of course it's not going to be straightforward, okay? So putting the TLB here is going to potentially slow things down. Putting the TLB here is going to keep the, tr uh, the cache lookups fast, but there must be some negative side to it. 
So what would be the downsides to having our TLB somewhere later in this, this sequence? Well, if you, if, you, if you were able to find the value in the TLB, you've got to go through an extra layer of cache. No, you'd go through less of a layer of cache. Because what we're saying is the cache doesn't store physical addresses. Oh. The cache stores virtual addresses. Okay. Right? Because we don't, the, the translation happens after the cache. So the cache has to operate on virtual addresses because that's what's being passed into the cache here. And then the translation happens here and we actually get physical addresses later on. So what might be a downside of, of this kind of construction? So you have to translate. No, we, in this case, we wouldn't have to translate if there was a cache hit, right? Yeah. So we would only have to translate on cache misses. Let's think about how virtual addresses work. How many virtual address spaces are there? Not virtual addresses, virtual address spaces. In other words, there's, there's a virtual address from 0 to FFFF. But there's not just one of them, right? How many of them are there? It's a uh, one million. Or no, it was because um, each each one of them is four kilobytes. So right? No, you're thinking about pages here, oh. right? We're talking about a full virtual address space from zero all the way up through this whole thing is called a virtual address space, right? And there needs to be somewhere in here um, a page table that used to map these virtual addresses to physical addresses, right? But there's going to be another one of these. I'll do them smaller now. And another one, and another one. When do we create another virtual address space? With its own exact same thing. Same. You have a page table, and you have those addresses from 0 to max it. Why do we have virtual addresses? What are we trying to do with them? Well, I guess we're trying to map them to uh, physical addresses. Well, we have to do that, but that's not why we built them, it, right? It, it, I mean, they provide like extra, extra space that physical addresses couldn't because there's they're, they're like an extra there's an extra layer in direction, yes. It helps us split up uh, our memory. For what? Uh, to be able to run multiple processes. There we go, right? So, so we're going to have this virtual address space for one process, right? Sure. And this one's going to be for another process, right? Yeah. So we're going to have quite a few virtual address spaces. Right? The way that we want this to work is that we're switching back and forth between these processes. Right? It's not that this is the only process that's running on our processor. We do this one, this one, this one, this one, come around, and we rotate through them all. Okay? So, I want you to think about now if the cache 
is operating on virtual addresses and we don't just have one set of virtual addresses but we have many set of virtual addresses if this virtual address space accesses this address, I'll just make it up 1A2F okay and then we switch from this process that's executing to this process that's executing and this process goes ahead and accesses the same 1A2F virtual address should they get the same value because they are the same virtual address no because they're different physical addresses. But how are we accessing memory in here? It's by virtual address, not by physical address. And so you get into a situation where this solution can lead to memory aliasing. Okay? Because you have two address, two virtual addresses but they should refer to two different physical addresses. But they look like they're the same location to this cache right here. So you have to do one of two things if you're going to support caches with virtual addresses. Option number one is you say, well, when I switch from running in this virtual address space to switching to this virtual address space, I'm just going to clear the cache. Then I know that anything in the cache is something I brought in from my current process and that there's nothing left over from a previous process. Okay? That can get um, expensive if you're switching back and forth between these two processes because you might want to keep some of the memory from this process and some of the memory from this process active in the cache at the same time. And so with the solution where every time we switch between these processes we're flushing the cache, there's no way to utilize the cache beyond a current, what's called a context switch. Right. And so um, that's solution option number one. Option number two is now you'll have some sort of additional register, which is basically the, the process ID right here. And so you will pass this in to the cache as part of the lookup. And so every lookup will have a virtual address and a process ID. To, so the memory has to match both the virtual address and the process ID in order to be a match. Um, there are other problems with this strategy, however because a lot of programs like to have shared memory. So if you think about um, shared libraries. So as a extreme example, the, C st the standard C library. Most programs that you run on your processor are linked against the C li standard C library. But they're sh it's a shared library, which means that where that library gets placed into a particular process's virtual memory could be different from program to program. So, for instance, in, in oh, I'll keep the color scheme here. In this situation, we may put the C library up here because that's where it best fit in that particular process. But in this one, we could have put it down here at the bottom right here. 
So it's in one virtual address space here. It's in a different, it's in, at one virtual address here. It's in a different virtual address in this address space. The crazy thing is when we look in our actual physical RAM, the mapping is going to be that this is here and so is this here because it's the same library. We don't want that library to appear twice in the physical memory. And we have a way to map this virtual address here, this other virtual address here, and it works. Um, and we would want then when this process accesses that shared library to have the, it in here and when this process accesses that shared library for it to already be in here. But they're different virtual addresses. And so we would, if we don't do things carefully, we would put this process in one location in the cache because it's one virtual address. And we put this processes in a different location in the cache because it's a different virtual address. But it refers to the exact same physical memory location right here. Okay? And it's a different way of thinking about aliasing now. Two different names for the same physical location in memory. And where does this, where, so that process that you were just talking about, where does that happen? Is that in software or is that in hardware? The, the mapping between here and here and here and here? Yeah. Software does that. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's software's job, usually the operating system or some program that it delegates sure. job to, to do the mapping. It's just the hardware is to look at the mapping and, and load the appropriate physical address given a particular virtual address. <clears throat> so if you, um, if you were doing the the method where you were flushing uh -huh. the cache every yes. time you switch uh, between processes, uh -huh. would that would that basically make that possible? The the aliasing? Uh, yeah, at least how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If you flush it, then so so it's either flush or do something to deal with aliasing. Okay. Those uh, are the the two options that you have to deal with. Uh, the problem is both of them have some sort of negative repercussion in some situation or another. Um, and it's seen um, and actually measured empirically early on in the uh, beginning stages of caches. People didn't know what the right answer to this was, and so some people built um, memory subsystems like this, and some people built memory subsystems like I, I mentioned earlier, um, and it turned out that in order to solve this problem, it made this um, empirically slower. So you don't tend to see this solution anymore. This is the solution that you see, where our caches, our entire memory subsystem deals with physical addresses. Now we don't have to flush on context switch. We don't have to deal with aliases because we're always dealing with physical memory in our entire Subsystem. What we do have to work with now is we have to deal with making sure that this doesn't become the slowdown that it looks like it sh could be. Right? This could be a slowdown because we have to do the translation logically before we do our lookup here. Okay? So let's build a system that takes, tries to fix that particular issue. All right. 
So what we're going to, to do is remind ourselves what the translation is between a virtual address and a physical address. <clears throat> what are the components of a virtual address? those relate to our physical address? The, um, the page refers to like the, um, the, the section. Uh-huh. Um, I'm, I'm sure these terms are. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and then also refer to um, like where in that, that block. So how do we translate these two components, the page number and the offset, into a physical address? The, so the, it would go into, isn't that where the, the, the table? This is where the TLB is going to come in, yep. And how do we take these two parts and turn them into a physical address? So the, the page number would be like the index into? Uh -huh. TLD, uh -huh. and that would, um, and I, and that would spit out the, the first, yeah, the first. Yep. What do we call this? It's not the page, but it's the uh, brain. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Because we've intentionally designed our pages to be the same size as our frames, our offset into a page is our offset into a frame. That's an intentional design choice. But we can build our system to do exactly this. So we take our offset from our page number and immediately use it as our offset into our physical address right here. So our offset doesn't have to actually go through the TLB. Okay? Now let's think about a cache for a second here. Okay? A cache, an address that is used by a cache, it, we also break it up into different components. So what are the components of an, an address that a cache uses? Well, I've been hinted by telling you that there are three different parts. Isn't there a tag? Tag, which is which of these three? We go farthest left. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. And how do we use each of these three values? Um, the tag is to, to refer to... Oh, this is our cache right here. Yeah. Are, are the the, the tag are both like location? No. Only one of them is a location. Doesn't the tag designate different? Like blocks? Yes. I, can I tell you that? Yeah, I thought that tag would be 
looking for like different blocks and then the block tells you which one within that chipset. Okay, so maybe you mean the right thing there. Uh, but I wouldn't call the tag as a location in the sense that this tag doesn't tell you where in the uh, yeah. cache to look, right? Yeah. We take our these block bits and they tell us this is where in the cache. That's the index into. Yes, it becomes the index. Some people actually call this the index into this cache, right? And this particular cache line has tag bits that it stored that we compare against these tags. Right? Yeah. And then this offset tells us which one of these elements we pull out of that cache line. And so there would be multiple, uh, like, blocks like that with uh, potentially different tag bits, um, and we would then pick the tag that corresponded to that. Right. Um, well, we would. Keeping it simple for a second here, if this is a direct map cache, we would only look here. Okay. And the tag bits just help us verify whether or not it's actually the address we're looking for or not. Right? That these bits have to match these bits here. Because, let me give you an example here. I'll erase this. I will, in blue, give one address where these tag bits are all zeros. Um, and I'll make it all zeros for the block and all zeros for the offset here. Okay? And in red, I'll give you a different address where the tag bits are all ones, but the block and offset remain zeros right there. Right? These are two very different addresses in our memory space. Yeah, right? But because we grab these blocks, they're going to they're going to, put to the point to the zeroth location, and they're both going to point to our zeroth location in our cache. And it's only be, by looking at these bits of the address, whether we know we stored this in our cache block, or we stored this in our cache block, right here. So we have to compare our tag with this tag in here, because this says this is the full bits of the address that's stored here. And then these are the full bits that we're looking for. And then we need to make sure that they match each other. Are, are you just saying that the tag is uh, refers to the most significant bits of the address? Yes. Okay. All right. So the interesting thing that I would point out is what we do is we pull this down. And we do a comparison here to tell whether or not we have a, a hit or a miss. The block told us where to look. The tag tells us whether we found what we're looking for. Okay. So let's now think about this breakdown of the address and look at this, these breakdowns of the address. And if we carefully align these two things, we can get some really nice behavior. That is, I'm going to pull this right down here. I said that our cache is going to use a physical address right here. Right? So we need to look at this part of the translation. That's what's going to be mapped into these three components right here. So what happens if I do this? <clears throat> if I intentionally make my tag line up with the page number and the frame number boundaries on our virtual and our physical addresses, that means that our block or our index from this is already available up here because we didn't have to go through the translation to figure out these bits right here. Right. 
So I don't know where these will end up. That's not important. But what it means is we can pass these bits from our virtual address into this lookup right here. And what we can do is pass these tags through our translation hardware while we're looking up the particular block that we're looking for, and we can do that simultaneously. We can do the lookup and the translation concurrently with each other. We don't have to do them one before the other, like I've implied in this drawing here, where we do the translation and then we do the lookup. Instead, what we do is we do them side by side like we have here, where we start doing the lookup here. With, while we're doing the translation here, we pull out the virtual tag here and compare it to the virtually translated tag from up here. Okay? And so now, while it looks like this should offer a slowdown. If we can do the translation fast enough that the lookup here and the translation happen in the same amount of time, then it's no slowdown at all. In fact, this setup is incredibly common and it's usually what limits the size of our TLB because we want to make the TLB fast enough that we can do that translation in this lookup time. Because remember, the characteristic of the TLB usually is fully associative, but small. Even small compared to this L1 cache right here. This technique of doing translation in parallel with lookup um, is called virtually tagged, right, because we have a virtually tagged, but physically indexed because we use the bits from our, from our physical, I'm sorry, virtually indexed because we use the bits from our virtual index right here, but physically tagged because we actually do the translation to the physical address right here. Virtually indexed, physically tagged. Is, is this technique right here. All right. If it wasn't for this, maybe we could grow the TLB more large and have even less misses in the TLB, but then we would really see the slowdown in our L1 cache. <coughs> All right. Questions about this? All right. Let's completely change topics then. And talk about parallel architectures. assignment up this evening, but you want to start going through the last chapter of the textbook, chapter 6. Uh, what we're going to talk about today um, is Floyd's, um, I guess it might be called classification of parallel architectures. So this is a way to 
think about how we're going to make the processor parallel. Okay. And uh, Floyd's um, classification goes across two um, different categories. We can think about our data that we're processing, or we can think about the instructions that we're executing. I shouldn't say or. I should say and. We can think about the instructions that we're executing. And what we can say is, when we look at our problem that we're trying to solve, are we trying to parallel, do a parallel technique that addresses the data? And are we doing a parallel technique that addresses the instructions? Okay. Um, and so, uh, what we can do is we can say we have a single piece of data that we're computing at any given time, or multiple pieces of data that we're computing. And we can do the same breakdown for our instruction. And then we can combine these together. This quadrant is known as SISD, where we get the S. The first S from up here, the I from here, the second S from here, and the D from, from here. And so you can do that with all four quadrants. What should this quadrant be right here? M I S D. And this one? S I M D. Uh -huh. M I M D. So according to Floyd, these were the four types of approaches that you could take to parallel processing. Uh, this one is none. And here we're not actually doing parallel processing because we're doing a single piece of, a single instruction is executing on a single piece of data at the same time. So this is the quadrant that we've been living in in this class up till now. We're executing one instruction at a time. Maybe the processor changes which instruction it's executing at any given time. And it's only executing that over a, a single set of operands. So I, I won't say single piece of data because um, you know most instructions do something like A plus B equals C, right? There's, two pieces of data that it's executing on and producing a third piece of data, but it's a single logical operation. So it probably would have been better, rather than call this data, maybe data slash operations or something uh, like that. Um, so from a parallel processing standpoint, this is not a very interesting quadrant to look at here. Let's go to this one, uh, the SIMD. Uh, the examples that you um, might come into um, originally were the connection machine 2, the connection machine 5, and so forth. Um, you might think of some Cray uh, vector processors uh, as fitting into this category, and um, some people may classify, say, current GPUs into this category. Um, NVIDIA is not one of those people. NVIDIA has decided to make their own quadrant that they call SIMT. Um, and so we will, we will get to that. But 
in a certain sense, uh, you can think of GPUs as being like a, a SIMD processor. So those are examples. Let's see what we mean here. Okay. So for a stereotypical SIMD processor, you're going to have a bunch of ALUs. Um, in some sort of arrangement here. That's not important for this classification discussion. Uh, but you are going to have one program counter. A program counter um, that is going to feed the instruction memory, and you're going to get out one singular instruction from this memory that you're going to pass in that same instruction to each one of these CPUs right here. So if the program counter points to an add instruction, every single processor is doing add. If it's a load instruction, every process is doing a load. If, it, if it's a multiply instruction, everyone's doing a multiply. That's what we mean by single instruction. They're not doing different instructions. They're all doing the exact same thing, and they're doing it in lockstep. They're all doing the same instruction at the same time, and they will finish at the same time and be ready to do the next instruction at the same time. Very much like a marching band. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a marching band or, or watched a marching band, but if you compare how a marching band walks down the street compared to how cars drive down the street, there is coordination involved, right? The drum major, along with the percussion, will be tapping out beats so that everyone knows when they should be doing their left foot and their right foot and when there's the right combination of signals, the entire band, all at once, will take the forward step. And that only works because everyone in the band does that forward step at the exact same time. Right? If there's miscommunication that occurs, and someone in the back decides to take a step out of turn, it's going to be chaos. Right? Because they bump into the person in front of them because they didn't move um, like they were supposed to. Or they started moving before they were supposed to, depending upon what the nature of the chaos is. So the SIMD has that kind of coordination in place that says, everyone, this is your instruction. This is your instruction. This is your instruction. But... their data that they're executing the same instruction on is not the same. Um, you might, depending upon how it works, have your own data memory that feeds into, uh, let me draw this a little differently. Maybe this is how it works. at least logically speaking, each processor is accessing a different part of data from each other. They're not being fed the same pieces of data. Um, for an easy type of problem that you could consider running on this, think of image processing, where you need to look at one pixel in the image. And this, so this processor, could be dedicated to one pixel, this one to the next pixel, next pixel, and next pixel, and so forth. And it'd be really easy to build this type of a processor because what one processor does with that part of the image is separate from what any other processor is doing on any other part of the image. And so that type of, of system works really well. <coughs> All right. 
So this is the SIMD type of architecture. And there are bright problems that fit into it. There are problems that don't fit this style very well. Um, if there is interaction between the computation of the processors because um, they need to be all doing something at the same time. All right, so that's one type of parallel process. This next quadrant right here, multiple instructions on a single um, logical piece of data. I have never seen a good description for what that is or how it works. This is kind of uh, almost like a theoretical classification that doesn't act, no one has actually built. There are some people that argue that pipelines are an example of this quadrant right here because you're taking a single piece of data and going through the pipeline and you're doing different instructions on that particular piece of data as it goes through the pipeline. I think the counter argument to that is that every time you go through a stage of the pipeline, you're modifying the data in some way. And so the data that you started with is not the data that you ended with. Uh, and, and, um, and so that's kind of, in my mind, kind of stretching it to call a pipeline an example of multiple instructions on a single datum. So I don't have a good example for you in this quadrant at all. Finally, multiple instructions, multiple data. Now, this, this was the example of cloud computing or um, Multi-core computing could be thought of as an example of, of this right here. Because now you've got a setup where you've got is fully replicated right here. So now, this ALU has its dedicated program counter, this ALU has its dedicated program counter, and they're operating on different pieces of data at the same time. They are very much independent. In fact, they're probably not even running in lockstep with each other. So when this processor finishes its instruction, it can go ahead and start its next instruction. And it doesn't have to communicate with this processor about having to start or stop its instructions. That's nice because the, you don't have to have all that extra apparatus on being able to say, do this instruction, do this instruction, do this instruction. So in here, synchronization is implicit because the hardware is built to be synchronized at all times. And when you're working with this type of a processor, synchronization needs to be explicit by the programmer because there's no inherent synchronization built into the architecture itself. This one and this one and that one and this one are all operating independently from each other and so you have to have some mechanism for them to say, hey, coordinate in this way because I want you to share this piece of data or I want you to send your results to this other location or I want you to receive results from this other location. And, and so there has to be some sort of explicit mechanism for doing that by the programmer that doesn't have to take place in the SIMD processor. 
all right? And so this is how Floyd broke down how we could attack or different ways that we could build parallel processing systems. We will look first in this quadrant on Friday, the SIMD quadrant, and say how do you build SIMD processors. All right? Have a great day, everyone. I will see you on Friday. Oh, oh.